you full screen, boom. All of you should see this, yeah? So I yeah. know you muted yourself, but I'm hoping that you, you get it, right? So good evening, this is the second lecture about the Italian Renaissance. Uh, last week, we started with the early re Renaissance, which was the end of the Middle Ages. So this lecture, we're going to talk about the proper Renaissance. And we're going to start immediately with somebody you've heard about, and his name is Leonardo da Vinci. So this is the painting that you're looking at is The Virgin and the Child by, with Saint Anne by Leonardo da Vinci. That painting is in the Louvre. So Leonardo da Vinci is considered by many to be one of the greatest painter in history of art. I mean, it's not my feeling, but he's certainly considered that way. He was also a sculptor, he was an engineer, he was a scientist, and he was an architect. And around the age of 14, he became a studio boy in the workshop of Andrea del Verrocchio in Florence. Uh, I showed you the work of Verrocchio last week. He was the leading Florentine painter of his time. So at his death, Leonardo became an apprentice by the age of 17 to a sculptor called Donatello, and he remained in training for seven years. And other uh, famous painters apprenticed in the same uh, shop, including Botticelli. So last week you, get, you were asking me, you know, how were people trained? They, people received very serious training. You know, they, they started as an apprentice and a master and they toiled for 10 years, 15 years as, as an apprentice until they were ready to, to fly with their own wings. So Leonardo da Vinci was exposed to a wide range of technical skill. And that included drafting, chemistry, metallurgy, metal working, uh, leather working, mechanics, woodwork, drawing, paintings. So you can see how highly trained uh, they were. So this is a view of the town of Vinci. So Leonardo da Vinci means Leonardo from Vinci. And Vinci is a little town uh, near Florence. It's in the province of Tuscany. He was born on the 15th of April in 1452. This is one of his painting. It's called The Annunciation. It's, uh, it was painted in 1472. And it's at the very famous Uffizi Gallery in Florence. It's quite an exquisite piece and it's nice to, to see it frame. And you can see the, the different level in the painting the, between the foreground, the middle ground and the background. The background is actually very, very beautiful. This is a sketch by Leonardo da Vinci. So you can see the quality of the draftsman. You know, people were highly trained and they, you know, they, they work on the, the, the fold of clothing endlessly. You know, look at the quality of this drawing. You can see his painting, but when you can draw like this, it's not, a, it's not, it's not very difficult to paint. This is just an amazing uh, quality drawing. This is just a drawing with ink on paper and some chalk. And this one, so you know about the Mona Lisa, but Leonardo da Vinci painted other women. Uh, this lady is called Ginevra di Benci. It's at the National Gallery of Art in London. Uh, Ginevra de Benci was a noble woman. She was born into a family of very wealthy Florentine merchant who had dealing with the Medici family. The Medici family ruled Florence. Isn't that a beautiful painting? It's lovely. Another painting of his is this one. This is called La Belle Ferronnière. It's at the Louvre Museum and we don't know who the woman was. The painting measures 25 by 18 and it's an oil on panel. So most of the artists worked on panel until canvas uh, became the most popular choice. 
So this is La Belle Ferronnière, and this one is the lady with an ermine. Ermine is that little animal, and from the fur of that animal, they would make this really white type of mink coat that would be worn by royalty. So the, the lady that you see has been identified as Cecilia Galignarani. She was the mistress of the Duke of Milan. And of course, you've seen this one. So again, you know, that Mona Lisa is very famous the same way Impressionists are famous. Do, do I think it's the greatest painting in the world? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's a good painting, but it's not any better than the two previous I just showed you by. by. Uh, the reason the Mona Lisa is very famous is because it, it was stolen. So uh, that's why you all know about the Mona Lisa. And when, when, Leonardo, when Leonardo da Vinci became very famous, he was invited by the King of France. His name was Francois I, Francois I. This is a painting by Jean Clouet from 1527 of the King of France. So the King of France invited Leonardo da Vinci to France. He, he lent him a castle so he could do his work. And when Leonardo da Vinci came to France, he brought with him the Mona Lisa. And since then the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. This is a very, very beautiful painting by Jean Clouet, a French painter at the end of the Middle Ages. Another Italian artist is Filippino Lippi. He was born in the town of Prato in Tuscany in 1457. I was born in 1457, so that's what, six, 600 years? And Filippo Lippi was the son of a painter. Again, he completed his apprenticeship in the workshop of Botticelli. Botticelli, I showed you his work in the past lecture and uh, Botticelli himself had been a pupil of the father Filippino. So this is the portrait of a youth. It's an oil on tempera on panel. It's at the National Gallery of Art in, in London. This is such a, a lovely piece. It's a love story. It's a portrait of a woman with a man at, at a casement. And I found that that piece very, very, very beautiful and very symbolic of the Middle Ages. These are two lovers, and of course it's treated with a lot of humil humility. It's very subtle. This, uh, this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the two figures that you see are Lorenzo Scolari and Angiola de Barnato Sapiti, and they were married in 1436. And the painting was created as a gift for the wedding. This is the appear, app, apparition of the Virgin to Saint Bernard. So again, you know, most painting of the time were religious or they were, they were some portrait. So this is the apparition of the Virgin, but you can see that Filippino Lippi, he depicted his characters of his religious painting but he, he added a very deep landscape, which recreated the ancient, the ancient world in all its detail. The detail of this painting and the depth are absolutely magnificent. This is a very large painting. It measures 83 inches by 77 inches. This is an annunciation, again, that, that motif is going to be repeated over and over. It's at the National of Art, Gallery of Art, again in London. This measures uh, 68 inches wide. And so Le Filippino Lippi was a very famous painter. And when he died, the day of his burial, all the workshops of the city of Florence were closed. That's how much he was admired. This is another annunciation. So for, for you who don't know, that, that included me not long ago, an annunciation is when 
the angel Gabriel told the Virgin Mary that she would conceive a child by the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, that's what people believe then. But this painting is absolutely beautiful. And you can see the introduction of perspective, which was largely ignored in, in earlier times. Look at the details, the carpet. Uh, you know, this is a painting that would take many, many months for sure. This is a painting of, by Carlo Crivelli of St. Thomas Aquina. If you don't know St. Thomas Aquina, he was a friar, but he was also a philosopher. And I have read some of Thomas Aquina. He was a very profound, intelligent man with very amazing wisdom. That, that did not necessarily have anything to do with religion. But I, I love this painting. I love the building to, to the left and, and the book. It's quite exquisite in its, in its details. This is an altarpiece. It's a portion of an altarpiece. It's the Demidov altarpiece and it's a painting of St. Stephen. And St. Stephen, the, the object that you see around his head are stones, and those are the stones that killed him because he was a martyr. So again, you know, it's not, it's the religious aspect may not interest many of you, but the, the quality of the painting is really what I want you to see. And you can also perceive that they added gold foil uh, to part of the painting, which was very, very common at that time. And the last painting by Cavo Cuvelli is this one, which is very unusual. This is Madonna and Child. Of course, you know, that has been painted a, a million times, but here it's very strange with the fruits hanging out. It's very unique. This is uh, 38 inches tall, and it is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Is that unusual for a painting of the time? A great artist of the time was Giorgione. Giorgione was born Giorgio Barbarelli da Castelfranco. That was his name. He was born in 1477. He was an Italian painter of the Venetian school. So he came from Venice during the high Renaissance and he died very, very young in his 30s but he's known for the elusive uh, poetic quality of his work. This is Sleeping Venus. It's uh, 69 inches wide. It is in a gallery of art in Dresden, Germany. It is absolutely spanning. The, the, the female body is absolutely magnificently rendered in, in my opinion. And the landscape is very, very soft. Giorgione also painted this. This is San Francis in the desert. It's an oil and tempera on wood panels. So tempera is pigment with egg yolk. So it's a mixture of uh, oil and uh, tempera. Look at this painting, the, the, the rocks, the landscape, the, the depth of the painting, are absolutely extraordinary. Uh, Giorgione was Titian master. And they both were pupils of Bellini. So again, all these people knew each other and studied under each other. So it was not a casual affair to become an artist. You studied as when you were very, very young with a master until you became your own master. This is Giorgione, Madonna and Child. It's an oil on poplar wood. It's a very large painting, again, about, about six feet tall. And you can, you can see the, the, the contrast. The contrast of the color is absolutely incredible. You know, the, the detachment between foreground and background and the, the sharpness and how vivid the colors are. So you can imagine artists like this, because they were famous, they had, they, they were able to use very expensive pigments. And when, when they were commissioned to do work, one of the things that worked in their favor 
was the ability to work with with very fine pigments. This is George Johnny. This is called the Three Philosophers. It's at the Art Museum in Vienna. And this one is one of his famous paintings. It's called The Three Ages of Man. It's an oil on panel at the Pidi Palace in Venice. Giorgione died of the plague on the 17th of September, 1510. He died very, very young. This is Raphael. You've heard of Raphael. Raphael is a very famous painter, you know, together with Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo. You can think of them as the, as the, you know, the traditional trinity of the great master of this period. This is a, a painting of a gentleman called Guidobaldo de Monteferro. It's at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. And this gentleman was the Duke of Urbino and he was born in 1472. It's quite a captivating uh, painting. This is the town of Urbino where he was born in Italy. I'm sure some of you have traveled to Italy and seen many towns like that. This is Raphael. This is the marriage of the Virgin. It was painted in 1504 and it's an oil on, on panel. You can see how softly the, the blending, the, how soft his work is and how, how beautiful the, the rendering of the figures and clothing. Absolutely beautiful blending. So uh, Raphael left us a large body of work despite the fact that he died at 37 years old. But 37 years old in the high Renaissance uh, was you were an old man by then. This is St. Catherine of Alexandria. I mean, there's no better of example of a you know, stunning painting, beautiful blending on the clothes, on the face. So, Raphael from 1500 to 1508, he became its own uh, independent master and he worked for central Italy, particularly in Florence, where he became very famous for his uh, paintings, mostly of the Virgin Mary. But, you know, artists at the time were commissioned to do work, so they did not choose to, you know, the, the subject matter. This is a portrait of a cardinal called Alessandro Fanese. It's an oil on panel that measures 55 inches tall and it was painted in 1512. And one thing I can tell you is that if I give you a tube of red paint and you painted this clothing, it would look like a big red blob, you know? With just one color, red, maybe cadmium red and a little bit of black, he's able to give dimension to his clothing and certainly character to, to the face of the Cardinal. And in 1508, he was called to the court of the Pope Julius II to help with the redecoration of the papal, the Pope apartments. And this is a portrait of the Pope Julius II. It's painted in 1511. It's an oil on poplar wood. It's quite striking with the red and the green. And it's not idealized. You can you feel that this is what the person looked like, which is uh, quite a change from earlier painting of the Middle Ages. This is a famous tale. This is St. George and the Dragon. Uh, I have shown you other pieces that, that repeated the same motif. This is an oil painting that is made in uh, 1506 and it's at the National Gallery of Art in London again. And the following one, this is St. George and the Dragon. This is St. Margaret and the Dragon. So in this, in this painting, the, the painting demonstrates the saint, uh, St. Margaret, before she is eaten alive by the mythical dragon. 
She is unafraid. She's holding the cross that will spare her once she's eaten. Uh, I don't know about that, but that is what she <laughs> did. Yeah, she thought the cross is going to help her. I don't think so. And this is the school of Raphael. So he had many students, and this is a fresco by different uh, students of his. This is a vision of the cross. So a fresco is, is you adding pigment directly to the plaster. So it's a very delicate thing. The inconvenience is you can't move the artwork. You have to actually take the, only, uh, the entire wall. And this is, uh, you have this one, and I have this one. Look how complex these frescoes are. And they measure dozens and dozens of feet. Very complex painting. The next artist is Antonio da Correggio. Correggio is another famous Italian artist. He was born in the town of Correggio. So he, all we know is his first name, Antonio from Correggio. He was born in, the, in that small town. We think he was born in 1489. And this is a painting of Saint Geronimo. And he also painted this very vivid painting of the head of Christ. Uh, this is at the Getty Museum. And again, you know, you can see the, the insistence that, that Jesus was a, a good looking white man, etc. When actually, you know, it's very likely that he was a Hebrew and he had a, a Middle East uh, face. That is much more likely, but that is how they chose to, to view him. This is a, a, a fresco, so it's a painting directly. This is the ceiling of Palma Cathedral in Palma. This is, it measures about 20 by 13 yards, an enormous painting. And I have painted ceilings myself and you, it's very, very difficult because your face is in it and it's hard to, 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 to see the forest for the tree. But that's the ceiling of the Palma Cathedral. And this is the inside of the Palma Cathedral. Isn't that splendid? Correggio also painted this. This is again Madonna and Child, but this one is very soft. Maybe the colors have faded. It's hard to tell, but it's nevertheless very beautiful. It's an oil and canvas that measures 22 inches tall. And this one is called No Limit and Jerry, which means Don't Touch Me. It's at the Museum del Prado in Madrid. And Don't Touch Me, it comes from a Bible story where Jesus, after his resurrection, spoke to Mary and he said unto her, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my father. That's the story from the Bible. And that painting has been uh, interpreted by many, many artists uh, in history. And this is the last painting I will show you of Correggio. This is Jupiter and Io. So this painting was inspired by the Roman poet Ovid and Roman mythology. This is a very unique artist with a very different style. This is Daniele de Volterra. This is David and Goliath. Uh, da Daniel da Volterra, again, we only know his first name. He was born in the little town of Volterra. He was a painter, he was a sculptor, but he's best remembered for his association with Michelangelo. So several of, uh, of his work were based on design that were created by Michelangelo. And after Michelangelo died, Daniel da Volterra was hired to cover the genitals on <clears throat> his last judgment. Is there an unusual sign? My voice is, <clears throat> let me drink some water. Isn't it an unusual painting? It looks like a collage. 
You know, it looks like different pieces have been, it's very, very unusual uh, technique. So we get to Michelangelo. This is the Daniel de Volterra, whom I just spoke about. This is his painting of, it's an unfinished portrait of Michelangelo. So you can believe that this is what he looked like when he was an old man. So Michelangelo, his name was Michelangelo di Lovidico Buonotorotti Simone. And he was born in 1475 and he died in 1564. So quite an old man, probably around 70 years old in this painting. So he's known simply of Michelangelo, Michael the Angel. He was a sculptor, he was a poet, an architect, uh, and a painter, of course. He was born in the Republic of Florence. You know, there's, Italy did not exist. Uh, they were just uh, a bunch of city-state like Florence and Venice. And Michelangelo certainly had a major influence on the development of Western art. So as a young boy, he was sent to Florence to study grammar. However, he showed no interest in, in uh, regular schooling. He preferred to copy paintings from churches and he sought the company of other painters. And in 1488, at the age of 13, he became apprentice to Gerlandaio, which is a very famous painter. And the next year, his father convinced the famous painter Gerlandaio to pay Michelangelo as an artist, which was very rare. So he, he started being paid at the age of 13 as an assistant to Gerlandaio. So he was very talented. This is a sculpture by Michelangelo this is a this is made of marble. It's at the St. Peter's Basilica. So after working for the Medici family in Florence, the, the French ambassador to Rome, to the Holy See, commissioned him to carve a pieta, which is a sculpture showing the Virgin Mary grieving over the body of Jesus. He was 24 years old when he completed this painting. So think of that. Imagine you've done this when you were 24 years old. That's astonishing, you know. And again, he was commissioned to do a painting of the Virgin Mary grieving over the body of Jesus. He's very specific. He wasn't told paint whatever you want. He was he was to, to he was told to to do a sculpture of this. 24 years old. And this is his famous painting of David. It measures 17 feet tall, huge, huge painting. So he was asked by the consuls of the Guild of Wool in Florence to complete a project that had been started 40 years earlier. And it's this huge statue of David. This is made of Carrara marble and it was to be placed in the Florence Cathedral. And uh, Michelangelo responded and completed this his most famous work in 1504. 17 feet this painting tall. This is the Carrara marble quarry. I thought it'd be interesting to show you how marble is carved from is, is is removed from the rock. This is what marble looked like before you do this. It's hard to imagine how one can start with a big block like this and, and do something so fine. It is just absolutely amazing. This is a fresco. This is the last judgment. It's a fresco at the Sistine Chapel. Uh, in 1505, Michelangelo was invited to Rome by the, the new, newly elected Pope Julius II and he painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and it took him about four years to complete it. And this is a, a, another image of the Sistine Chapel, the ceiling. Not an easy thing to paint this enormous ceiling, four years. And this is a detail. This is just one of those little paintings.
So, you know, I'm not really into painting of this period because all the men look like Greek gods, and but this was very popular at the time. The next study is, is Bronzino. And Bronzino is quite amazing, as you can see his work. He was, he was born Agnolio di Cosimo, and he is usually known as Bronzino. He was born in Florence, he, where he lived actually most of his life. And he was the court painter to Cosimo de' Medici, who was the Grand Duke of Tuscany. So mostly he was a portraitist, but he also painted some religious subject. And this is his best known work. This is the allegory of the triumph of Venus. So in the painting is Venus, Cupid, Folly, and this is the allegory of the triumph of Venus. So what you can see, uh, again, you know, this is not a, a subject that you may like, is the quality of the work, you know, uh, of the bodies painting the, the skin. It just, it's quite a master that can paint this. He painted this, this, this is the Holy Family. And again, you can see the exceptional uh, is his mastership. You know, his ability to paint, just remarkable. So this is at the Pushkin Museum of Art. And this paint, this measures 50 by 40 inches. He also did portrait. Look at this amazing portrait. This is a portrait of a young man. We don't know who he is. This is at the National Gallery of Art in London. And the contrast with this, uh, kind of spruce dark, the, the clothing against the, the reddish pink of the curtain is very, very striking. He also painted this painting, which is again, very striking. You know, the, the clothing against the, the green of the curtain. This is a portrait of Lovodico Caponi. It's painted in 1550. It's at the Frick Collection in New York. This gentleman was Lodovico Caponi, was a page at the Medici court. This is a portrait, same artist Bronzino. This is a portrait of Stefano Colonna. Stefano Colonna di Palestrina in the 16th century was the commander of the Florentine militia during the siege of Florence. Bronzillo also painted this. This is a portrait of a young man. It's painted in 1530. Again, you know, if I gave you a tube of black paint and you try to paint is, is clothing, it would just look like a big black blob. So it's astonishing that with just one or two colors, you know, maybe black and purple, is able to, to, to suggest so many details and give the painting so much depth. And the, I also have a painting now of a woman. This is his painting of Eleonora di Toledo. It's painted in 1562. Eleonora di Toledo was the daughter of the Viceroy of Naples. And he was, uh, you know, it was long, not long after he painted this he, that he became the court painter of the Duke of, of Cosimo. Look at the details of the clothing. So this painting became very famous and he became very popular. So he painted different version of this one. Look at the clothing. So, you know, you maybe he had people working with him. It's likely he would have students. But knowing what I know about painting, this is a painting that would require, you know, two years of work. It's incredibly detailed. The, the quality of the clothing is simply astonishing. This is a detail of the clothing. Look at that. So this painting was very popular. So he, he did other version of the same painting. 
but again, same quality, extraordinary clothing, just with a different background. So this is Eleonora di Toledo with her son. It's at the Uffizi Gallery. And the last of Bronzino is this one. I wanted to show it to you because it's highly unusual. It's a profile. It's a portrait of Laura Battiferi. It's at the Palazzo of Vecchio. Laura Battiferi was an Italian poet during the Renaissance period. So she was a woman and a famous poet in Florence. I love that painting. And it is quite special that they would honor a woman and a poet. The next artist is Giorgio Vasari, very, very different once again. This is a painting of six different poets from Tuscany, painted in 1544. So Vasari was an Italian painter. He was an architect. He was an engineer. He was an historian. He was a writer. But he is best known for a book that he wrote about the lives of the most excellent painters and sculptors and architects of Italy. And he was also designed, Vasari was asked to, to design the tomb of Michelangelo in the Basilica di Santa Croce in Florence. This is Vasari. This is The Temptation of San Jerome. It's painted in 1541. A large painting again, it's about six feet tall. So Vasari was born in a little town called Arezzo in Tuscany, and he was recommended at a very early age. Uh, he became a, a, a pupil to a famous glass artist, and he was sent to Florence at the age of 16, and he became a friend with Michelangelo, and Michelangelo's style would definitely influence Vasari's work. So this is The Temptation of St. Jerome's. I have one more painting of uh, Vasari. This is St. Luke painting the Virgin. It's a fresco, so it's painted directly on wall. I don't know what the bull is doing, or the cow is doing there, but you know. I have one painting of one artist I only have one painting of his because very little is known and we don't have much work. This painter is Francesco Francia. He was a, an Italian painter uh, born in Bologna in 1447. And I found this painting, the painting is quite naive, but I, I find it absolutely beautiful. It's quite special. It's a portrait of a young boy called Federico Gonzaga, and it's painted in 1510. The next artist is this one. This is Benoso Gosoli, and I, I only chose one of his work. You can see the, the fanciful way they painted landscape. Nevertheless, it's a very detailed painting with a lot of depth. Uh, this painting measures about 10 feet. It's quite exquisite and very, very colorful. This is a procession of the young king. It's a fresco, which is at the Medici Riccardi Palace in Florence. The next artist is Tintoretto. Tintoretto was born Jacobo Robust in 1518, and he was a painter from the Venetian school. Very unusual technique. This is St. Mark's body brought to Venice. It measures 13 by 10 feet. So Tintoretto was, a, was both admired and criticized because he painted very, very fast. His work was very bold, and he was also named El Furioso from Furious, because he's, he's, he, was, he, had quite, he had quite a temper. So you can see he usually painted very muscular figure with very dramatic uh, postures and a very bold use of perspective. So the, the crowning achievement of his work is this one, this is called Paradise. 
It's painted in 1588. I don't know how long it took. It's at the Dutch Palace. It measures, let me see, it measures 75 feet wide by 29 feet. So you can see, you know, a painter is going to, I don't know how long it took. I mean, I could suppose it takes 10 years to paint that. It's it's mind boggling. And this is a fresco. This is actually, sorry, it's an oil on canvas and it is known to be the largest canvas ever created. I don't know if it's true, but this is canvas. It's quite impressive. And this is his painting of Christ washed, washed, washing the feet of his disciples. You can see a very unusual uh, perspective, very dramatic, very unique style with very fast and hurried brushstroke, very confident painter. This is, uh, again, a very different perspective. This is Queen Saba visit to Solomon. It's a biblical story. So Tintoretto became one of the leading painters in Venice and he had a very large workshop. So he worked uh, on a number of commissions for the Dutch Palace. He was mostly self-taught, but he was very, very creative in his uh, composition. I'm gonna show you two paintings and I will explain the meaning later because the, the the subject matter has been used by other artists. This is Esther before Ahasuerus. It's a biblical story. I will explain it in a little bit. This is in a royal collection in London. And this is Susanna and the Elders. So I'll explain it to you in a little bit, but you can see this creepy old man watching this beautiful young woman. So this is at the Art Museum in Vienna. And this is a presentation of Mary in the temple. Again, you can see how unusual his work is and how unusual the perspective is. This is the presentation of Mary in the temple. This measures 16 by 14 feet. So an enormous painting. And the last painting of, of this artist in Toretto is, no, actually, I don't have another one. This is the church where this painting is. This is the Madonna dell'Otto Church in Venice. I'll make you happy because I have two women artists from Italy, from the High Renaissance. And there weren't many women artists that became successful. The first one is Sophonisba Anguissola. And she's quite famous. She was, she was, this woman was born in a teeny town called Cremona to a, to a poor noble family. She had a you know fine uh, education, but, but she set a precedent for women to be accepted as a student of the art. So as a young woman, she traveled to Rome where she was introduced to Michelangelo. And Michelangelo immediately recognized her talent. So this is a self-portrait of Sophonisba and Guisola. And this is a chess game with her sisters. She had three sisters. So her name is Sophonisba, her, sister, her sisters were called Lucia, Minerva, and Europa. It's a bit uh, exaggerated name, but those were the name of her sisters playing chess. This is a very large painting, it measures six feet wide. This is her painting of Elizabeth de Valois. She's a French noblewoman who became the Spanish queen. So uh, Anguissola, the, the woman artist, went to Madrid and she became a lady in waiting to Elizabeth de Valois. Elizabeth de Valois, the, the queen of Spain, was married to Philip II. And this is another painting by uh, Sophonis Anguissola. She painted the king 
and she later became an official court painter to the king. So for a woman of the time, it's quite extraordinary her achievement. She painted this quaint painting. This is a portrait of a young boy at the Spanish court. This is actually at the San Diego Museum of Art. It's quite unusual. Maybe it was a page or something like that. This is a portrait of a young lady, same, same woman artist. It's a Nolan canvas that measures 42 inches. I don't know that it's the best resolution, but the clothing is absolutely beautiful. And this is her painting of the Archduchess Anna of Austria. It's painted in 1560. And the last painting of her, of her work is this painting of Prince Alessandro Fanese. He was the Duke of Parma. And you can see the quality of the painting. The clothing is absolutely incredible. You know, I, I wish on Zoom I could, I could zoom in in pictures to show you more detail. But uh, you can you can do that yourself at a later time. But the the, the detail and the rendering of the clothing is absolutely magnificent. So I have another famous woman artist from the Italian Renaissance. This is Artemisia Genticelli. Sorry, Artemisia Gentilecci. Uh, she was one of the first women to to forge herself a very successful career as a painter. She was celebrated internationally in her lifetime. She was born in 1593. She was what you could call an Italian Baroque painter. She was producing uh, professional work by the age of 15. So in an era when women had very few opportunities to pursue uh, artistic training or work as a professional artist, uh, Gentilecci was the first woman to become a member of the Florence Academy of Art, and she had uh, an international clientele. So this is a self-portrait of her, herself. This is Judith and her maid servant. So Artemisia Gentilecci was born in Rome. Her father was a painter. And his work was inspired by Caravaggio, as was her work. And I will show you Caravaggio in a little bit. Uh, Artemisia Gentilecci was raped at the age of 18 years old by another artist called Agostino Tassi. Uh, as you know, so he, he raped her, but he refused to marry her, as was the custom. So there was a seven month trial after which he was exiled from Rome. So the only problem is you could only try it for rape if the victim was a virgin. So during the trial, Artemisia was tortured with thumb screws for the purpose of verifying her testimony. Those were the days. So uh, here next, I'm gonna show you those two paintings I showed you before by, by, by her. This is Susanna and the Elders. It's a Nolan canvas. So the story of Susanna and the Elders is related to the books, the book of Daniel. It's a, the New Testament or something like that. It's a very popular subject for artists in the 16th century. So Susanna is a virtuous, beautiful young woman. She's, she's by herself in the garden, but there's two old men that are spying on her. And they want to rape her. And if she resists, they want her, they will ruin her reputation by claiming that they caught her with a lover. That's the story of Susanna and the Elder. And this one, I showed you a different version earlier. This is Esther before Ahasuerus. It's another Bible st story. Uh, and you can see the beautifully dressed Jewish beauty. Her name is Esther and she's supported by two maid servants. And to her right is the king of the Persians, Ahasuerus. 
who reigned from 486 to 465 BC. So Artemisia, the painter, became a successful court painter and she enjoyed the patronage of the House of Medici. And you can, you can see why people thought she was a great painter. And the last painting of her is derived from Greek mythology. This is a painting of Danae. Danae in Greek mythology was the mother of Perseus and her father was Zeus. So a lot of the artwork, besides being religious, was also derived from mythology, Greek or Roman uh, mythology. It's quite an unusual painting for the time. The background is very, very different. This is Lorenzo Lotto. He was an Italian painter from Venice. He was born in 1480 and he mostly painted religious painting. He did a little bit of portrait. This is a portrait of a Venetian woman as Lucrezia Borgia. Uh, Lucrezia Borgia is a, fam it's a famous name. She was an Italian noblewoman of the house of Borgia and she was the illegitimate daughter of the Pope Alexander VI. And she reigned as the governor, uh, a position usually held by cardinals. So this is just a portrait of Venetian woman dressed as uh, Borgia. And Lorenzo Lotto also painted this it's quite familiar in theme and technique, but it's nevertheless quite beautiful. This is Madonna and Child with St. Catherine and an angel. It's a 60 inch wide painting. So now we get to Caravaggio. Caravaggio is a very famous painter. He was born Michelangelo Merisi and he has the name of the town where he was born, Caravaggio. And in 1592, Caravaggio moved to Rome. And while his, you know, his first year was struggle, he specialized in still life and he painted fruits and flowers, which he sold on the street. This is a painting of Francis de Assisi in ecstasy. It's not easy, again, it, you know, you can, I, the, the, the background, even though you, you basically see just one color black with a few highlights, he's able to convey depth in, in his background. This is his painting of San Francis in prayer. So Caravaggio, after you know selling his work in the street, his luck changed in 1595. Uh, a famous cardinal called Francesco del Monte recognized his talent and he took Caravaggio into his household. So through the cardinal circle of acquaintances, he received his first public commission and he became a celebrity almost overnight. This is Caravaggio flight, rest onto the flight to Egypt. It's a Nolan canvas that measures 66 inches wide. This is the crucifixion of St. Peter. So again, it's overwhelmingly religious, but I, I just want you to, to look at the quality of the painting. So Caravaggio, you know, became very, very famous, but he was also known as a violent and provocative man, uh, a brawl, he got into a fight and he, he killed someone. So he was sentenced for murder Caravaggio was forced to flee to Naples, but in Naples again, they forgot his, they forgave his murder and he, he continued painting, great painting. This is the calling of St. Matthew. It's a Nolan canvas that measures 11 feet by 11 feet, an enormous painting. And you can see his use of chariot score, which is, you know, the, uh, the use of dark and light lit by candle. So in 1607, Caravaggio traveled to Malta, then to Sicily, and then he went back to Rome where the Pope forg forgave, forgave him for his murder. 
but he was involved in another fight where his face was disfigured and he died. So people question his, you know, his mental state and his bizarre behavior as you would uh, Van Gogh. So he died in 1610 in very mysterious circumstances. Some say he died of a fever. Some others said he was murder murdered or he died of lead poisoning. This is the fortune teller, Bad Caravaggio. It's in the Louvre Museum. And this one is the card cheaters, a much lighter subject. So it's nice to see artwork that is not religious. This is the card cheaters, 52 inches wide painting. And I wanted to show you his piece here, which is unusual. It's a still life with fruits. I, I told you earlier that he made, when he was young, he made his living painting fruits and flowers and he sold his painting in the street. Uh, I have added this painting uh, tonight. Somebody that was supposed to be in the lecture loved Caravaggio, so he asked me to have this painting uh, displayed. I wanted him to comment on this piece, but he's not here, so I don't know much about this piece. It's called Alove de Vignacourt. He was a French noble and he was a master order of Saint John of Jerusalem, so kind of a Templar order, and he was also a patron of Caravaggio. This is Veronese, Pablo Veronese. This is Mars and Venus united by love. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Veronese was born in 1528 and is another very famous Italian painter uh, with amazing quality of work. So this is Mars and Venus united by love. Again, you know, the, this is inspired by uh, Greek and Roman mythology. And this is his painting. This is a fresco on wood panel. This is the family of Darius before the Emperor Alexander, Greek Emperor Alexander. So this is a wall painting. So you can presume that the colors have considerably faded since it was created. Nevertheless, it's, it's quite impressive. I will leave you with a very unusual artist for the Italian Renaissance. And his name is Giuseppe Asimboldo. The first painting I'll show you of his seems, you know, like something you've seen before. This is a, a painting of the Holy Roman Emperor of Austria with the Infanta Maria of Spain and the children. It, it's a very large painting. It's about nine feet tall. Giuseppe Asimboldo is an artist, an Italian artist. He was born in 1526, and he's known for his very surreal portrait, as you will see in a little bit. But he was also a conventional port painter for three different Holy Roman emperors in Vienna and Prague. This is his allegory of winter. It's an oil on linden wood. Linden wood is a type of wood. It's, his work is very, very surreal. You know, it's as extraordinary for his time as was the work of uh, Euronymous Bosch during the, the Flemish period. And this is his portrait, and that's pretty amazing. This is his portrait of Rudolf II, Holy Roman Empire. And he painted him as Vertumnus. Vertumnus was a Roman god of the seasons of the garden and fruit trees. That's pretty amazing. This is painted in 1590. And the last painting I'm gonna show you tonight, I chose it as last because it is quite a lot of fun. This is called The Librarian. This is by Giuseppe Asimboldo. It measures 38 inches. And it is thought to be the portrait of Wolfgang Lazius, who was a humanist. A humanist during this time was a philosopher. 
Isn't that an amazing painting for the time? Very, very creative, not religious, and very unique in the history of art. Mm -hmm. So that ends my lecture. The next two lectures are going to be very, very different. I'm going to show you German art. And the same way that people don't think that German language is a loving language, you'll be surprised to see German art. German art is simply extraordinary. So I'm going to stop sharing screen and then you can unmute yourself and we can talk.